We are into the month of October, and this is a very exciting time around here because that means it's Missions Month, and we are just getting very excited for that. And I wanted to give you just a a little snippet as this is going to help us for this whole month. We're into this series now, Press On, and I'm going to read the verse where that comes from, give you a little bit of context, and then we'll get into our message today. So it comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. It's Philippians 3. I'll read verses 12 through 14. He says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made, has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Everyone say, one thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our upcoming theme for our World Missions Conference in two weeks, wow, is press on. Press on. And we're going to be saying that short, encouraging phrase a lot to each other. I encourage you to adopt that into your vocabulary. You'll be hearing it a lot this month. So I wanted to talk about that phrase, what it means, where it comes from. What I like to do when I got a particular phrase or a key word in the Bible that it seems to really hold the meaning of that verse or that passage. I like to go back to the original language. In this case, we're looking at the New Testament. We're looking at Greek. And so it's written in that language. But even if you don't understand biblical Greek, if it's Greek to you, thank you. I paid a few people to chuckle at that one for me. Uh, In candy corn, no less. But... um, but if you, don't, if you can't quite get to the Greek and you look at it, and it, again, it looks Greek, one, way, one thing you can do, I like going to BibleGateway.com, get out your computer or your phone, and if you look up a specific verse reference, so like Philippians 3.14, there's a link there that you can see it in all English translations. And Bible Gateway has 63 of them. So you can see, you can scroll through and see that one verse in 63 different translations. So I did that, and these are some of the phrases that all of the the biblical interpreters that brought it from Greek uh, and our manuscripts into the English language, these are the different phrases or words that they've used for press on. This is the range of possibilities. They say, follow after, actively press on, make every effort, press on, pursue, continue trying to reach, keep trying, keep pushing, keep working toward. Do you feel the energy that's in that? This is a word with movement. So the Greek word, if you wanted to know that, it is dioko, which is super fun to say. Go ahead and try it. Dioko, there will be a quiz. It means I press on, I press on. The word is, it is figurative here. It's used this way uh, as one who in a race runs swiftly to reach the goal. Now seeing that translation, hearing the definitions, what it's trying to convey, it reminds me a lot of when I was a runner, (laughs) not currently a runner, but when I was a runner and when I was coaching runners. So in a road or track race, you have what's called different tempos or different pace. So there's different training tempos. And so those different training tempos, they have different purposes. You can have a nice, slow, easy tempo. That's your warm-up tempo. You're just getting going, just getting some uh, some motion going. But if you run the whole race in your warm-up tempo, you're going to get lapped you're going to lose. You're going to get last place. So I don't think that's the tempo that Paul is talking about with this word that he's using. And so uh, take an event. Did anybody watch a little bit of the Olympics? Hopefully not the opening ceremony. My goodness. Um, but the events, um, the 400 meter is one of my favorite ones to, to watch. Even at a high school level, it's an exhilarating race to watch. And it's a full lap around the track, and they're sprinting the whole time, which I just get like winded thinking about it. But um, and so if you saw uh, the Olympics this past summer, we have these top athletes, the men's gold. It went to a 26-year-old named uh, Quincy Hall, an American, and he ran the whole track in 43.4 seconds. Whew, just cruising. If you're wondering, that is 21 miles per hour. <laughs> That's really fast. I didn't even drive to church here that fast this morning. Um, fun fact, if you go on the Shell Lake walking path and you sprint where the like you're going this fast sign is, it will pick you up. And so you can see how fast you can sprint. The most I've ever pegged personally is right around a 13. So not a sprinter by any means, but this guy was going 21 miles per hour. And so what's interesting is that for 350 meters of 400 meters, so that's almost all of them, Quincy Hall was trailing the guy who got second place, Matthew Hudson Smith from Great Britain. 
For 350 meters, of 400 meters, Quincy was behind him, sometimes up to a half a second or a second behind him. He beat him by 0.04 seconds. 0.4 hundredths of a second is the, the gap. So it was a photographic finish. And so what he did, what Quincy did, what is what we call in running the kick. He had the kick. He had the heart. He had the grit, that epic heart-pounding moment, you've got to put it all out there right now or else kind of mindset to finish the race. And I think that's getting to what Paul was saying when he says, press on. He says, I press on towards the goal. It's not the warm-up pace. It's not even the pace where you felt like you were trailing behind the whole time. It says, no, you've got to find a deeper gear. You've got to dig deep. You've got to switch that gear. You've got to get focused. You've got to put it all out there. Pour everything you've got into it, that kind of mindset that says, I don't want to get to the finish line knowing I have something left to give. Amen? Knowing, I don't want to get there knowing I could have pushed myself a little more. Knowing I could have been focused. I could have been more intentional about how I was running the race. To press on is to have our focus set towards the goal of that heavenly finish line. Jesus is calling us up, and he says, I set my goal, I set my eye, I set my mind on that. I press on, I strain forward, and that's the perspective that Paul had. Now, I want you to know, Paul was writing to the Philippians from prison. He was in prison, probably the Roman imprisonment. He had appealed to Rome. So your reading assignment this week is start in chapter 21 of Acts, and it's literally like through the rest of the chapter Paul just spends the last eight chapters of Acts basically in imprisonment. And so today's pers- uh, what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to preach on Paul's prison perspective. And if you're wondering, yes, I really enjoyed the alliteration this time. Paul's prison perspective as we preach on press on. Okay. <laughs> yes. And I have three points, and yes, they all start with P. I have no apologies for that. I love it. So Paul, he spends this time in this relatively short letter to the Philippians, and he's talking to the church about how they ought to think and how they ought to orient themselves in the world. It's a quick read, so you're going to read Acts 21 through the end. Great stories. Paul gets shipwrecked. It's just crazy stories. And then you're going to read Philippians 4 to get your hearts and minds ready for this month. Okay, you got some homework this week. I encourage you to do that. Get in. Um, the letters are really nice. Philippians is four chapters. Um, if you aren't a great reader, follow along and use the audio Bible, and it'll get you through it in about 10 minutes. So we're going to look at Paul's approach today. It's a healthy, it's a helpful guide for us. And the reason is because we live in a world that is diametrically, like if you're on a circle, we're on two opposite sides of that circle, diametrically opposed to the mind of Christ. The world does not lend itself towards us having the mind of Christ. Of course, we read about that mind of Christ in Philippians. The world is also totally bent on disorienting us here in this world. So Philippians, Paul is trying to help them have the mind of Christ. He's trying to help orient them in the world, and that helps us a lot today too. So uh, what I'm saying today, what I'm saying this morning, is that if you're a child of God, you have eternal life to look forward to, that should affect how we live this life here on earth. And so thinking like Christ and being oriented in this world really matters. So Paul challenges us. We're going to look in the first chapter. I'm going to look at a few verses there. But he challenges us in three aspects uh, to have that right perspective right here in the first chapter. I'm going to give you these three points right up front uh, so you can see them. Paul's prison perspective. First is his priority is to know Christ. His priority is to know Christ. We'll look at First chapter, uh, verses 9 through 11. Second, his passion is to preach Christ, for Christ to be preached. That'll be verses 12, 19, or tw- uh, verses 12 through 19. And then his privilege is to suffer for Christ. We'll look at verses 20 through 21. So I'll invite you to stand with me. Those will come up. Um, we'll repeat those if you didn't quite get them. I'll invite you to stand. We're going to turn or turn on our Bibles and swipe to... Uh, Philippians 1, and I'm going to read verses 9 through 21. Are you with me this morning? Amen. Paul says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters. 
so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped me to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way. So I rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For me, for to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. Let's pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds today. Have your way. Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth. Speak to our spirit today and help us to grow and to be challenged in this perspective to glorify Christ in all that we say and do. Everyone said amen. 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 Go ahead and take a seat. So let's look at Paul's prison perspective. This is our motivation. This perspective helps us to press on. First, Paul addresses his priorities. Paul's number one priority was to know Christ. To know Christ. We can hear that in the way that he prayed for the believers in Philippi. I'll read verses uh, 9 through 11 again. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God today. If you're taking notes today, the first way that we know that we know Christ is that we overflow with love. We overflow with love. Now, we talk a lot about love um, because Jesus and basically the whole rest of the New Testament talks a lot about love. And this is that agape love, that Greek word we've talked about. It's that type of love. It's that selfless love. It's willing to be poured out for another without expecting anything in return. And just now I'm reminded of that, um, the devastation between the Florida coastline and Kentucky was just absolutely unprecedented. So I don't know if you've been watching the news, a hurricane hit the middle of the Appalachian Mountains. That doesn't even make sense. That doesn't happen. And so this week I've watched as, as other certain agencies and authorities have drug their feet on responding while contrasted with the church just jumping to it. And, and, and rallying together. And there was one church, they requested a, a generator so that they could have church today. And they've got a, a tree with mud blocking their front entrance so they have the side door open and they're going to have church today. So Lord, be with them right now. Uh, the church matters. Being a part of a church matters. We're here for each other. And so I just, I'm overcome with that. I encourage you to keep praying. If you are interested in giving financially towards relief efforts, I do have a good link for that. If we're friends on Facebook, you've already seen that. But the association that we're a part of, the IMA, uh, has really great friends. Uh, Dr. Richard Hilton, his church in Tennessee, Johnson City, kind of right in that area, we've been able to connect with him. So if anyone does have it on their heart to give financially, let me know. Catch me after service. Uh, we're staying tuned. I'm waiting to hear if, any, if there's any churches or different things that we could potentially get, to, uh, get a group together that go down and, and help rebuild 
Uh, I don't know if we'll be able to do a cleanup, uh, but be help with rebuilding. So anyways, agape love. <laughs> it's supposed to be overflowing. So uh, even in our prayers, in our finances, in how we look out for each other, amen. Rabbit trail uh, complete. So this is that agape love. Remember, agape love. When we know Christ, when we really know him, that kind of love is overflowing. That's what we would expect to see from Christ's church when something like that hurricane happens. So what I would wonder this morning is how many people think that communities benefit from Christians who are really living out this love. Amen? That is love on display. So Paul prays that their love will overflow more and more. The image that comes to my mind is like a spring that just keeps welling up with water. If you ever go on Highway B east of town and it goes down the big hill after 253, before 53, and there's that artesian well there, uh, I always, even if I, I'm not intending to go there, if I'm driving past it, I find some empty water bottle or something in my car and I always swing in and grab some water. But it's that idea of this well of love that it's just, it just keeps flowing in us. So now remember, love is a fruit of the Spirit, Right? Love, joy, peace, patience. It's the first one listed. Love is a fruit of the Spirit, and it's the forerunner of all the other fruit. It's that principal thing Paul talks about in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. These three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We ought to love one another as Christ loved us. Husbands ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Love is the overflowing, the more and more. When we know Christ... Love should be overflowing more and more. Also, to know Christ means that we keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. So again, I dug into some of the Greek words here. This knowledge here is knowing how to think. It's not just what we're thinking, but it's knowing how we ought to think or how to think. And this understanding is knowing how to act or how to uh, behave, but knowing the right from the wrong, the morality. So this, this knowing and this understanding, Paul prays that they would grow in this knowledge of knowing how we should think. Right thinking about God, that's our theology. Right thinking about the world around us and our ideas, that's our philosophy. Right thinking about humanity, that's your anthropology, if you're taking notes. Right thinking about our bodies, that's biology, right? This right thinking. Knowing Christ means that we are growing in the knowledge of how we ought to think, how the Creator designed us to think. And the beautiful thing here is that God has not just left us to our devices. Can I get an amen? He sees us. He cares about us personally. He speaks to us. He has revealed himself through his word, through Jesus Christ himself. And God gives the tools to us and the means to grow in right thinking. So we have this saying in our household, I call it no negative self-talk. And we stay on top of this one. We, we do this with discipline. Again, I've got three girls in the home. Um, my wife is a lovely lady. And then we also have a dog who happens to also be female. So it's a totally female household. I hold down the fort. Um, but that's the background here. What, I'm, what I mind with all diligence is um, we don't go around saying things like, I'm the worst. I say, no, let me stop you right there. You're a child of God. You're a daughter of the king. You didn't make the right choice just now, but we're not going to talk about ourselves that way, and we're not going to talk about ourselves in a way that disagrees with what God says about us. So the rule is no negative self-talk. And so that's just an example from our home life. You can do that with each other. It doesn't have to be just in that area of thinking about ourselves. And so this beauty of living in community, of being part of the church and part of a church family as Christians, uh, when, we're, when we're with other people, other people are usually better at catching when our thinking is getting off track. You ever notice that? Any married people in the house? Yes. We are, the wives help husbands so much, and occasionally also the husbands suggestively help their wives think right too. God give us grace. But um, we are so blessed in relationship. When you have a shared trust and you have a shared concern 
for one another. In other words, when agape love is overflowing more and more in our relationships, we can help each other stay on the pathways of right thinking about ourselves, about God, about biblical perspectives, about our bodies. We can help each other keep on the path of right thinking. It's when we get isolated or alone with our thoughts for too long that our thinking gets weird. Stinking thinking, right? It's, that happens when we isolate from each other. We get off of that path. The thing is, we need each other. Turn to somebody and say, we need each other. I'll make sure no one was left out. Turn to someone else and say, we need each other. We need each other. Now, the other part of this, that's right thinking, knowing how to think. The other part of this that Paul's praying for is understanding. Understanding is also part of that pathway of right thinking, but it's at that point where thinking turns to action. It's where thinking turns to action, knowing what is right and what is wrong and knowing to do the right thing. That is understanding. This idea of understanding right and wrong, it's something that it's a really prevalent issue in our society today. And I think the big reason for that is because much of society has shifted to look to secularism and materialism for its foundations. And when I say materialism, I mean the only things that are real are things you can feel. And what has happened is rather than acknowledging that there is a God, there's a creator God who is the originator, he's the supreme judge of this understanding of what is right and wrong, when we take God out of the picture, the secular humanism, the material atheism, what they try to do is they try to build this whole system that's from the vantage point of self, from the self vantage point. You take God out of the picture, now right and wrong becomes totally subjective, up to the subject, I. The problem is it doesn't work. So secularists and atheists, they have to borrow the ideals that are based on the moral foundations of belief in God and the Bible, and then they have to deny the connection. Let me give you an example. The Declaration of Independence is our formal document. It declared to the king of the UK that the U.S. colonies were stepping out from under the throne. We're done. This is back in 1776. Now listen to these words. This is how it's actually written. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Remember that part. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You see, what makes these things self-evident is based on the fact that all men were created equal and they were endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, the revolutionists, they understood something here. The premise for the revolution was that there was a violation of these rights. There was a violation of those rights, something that was entirely against them as a people. Rather, or Sorry, it wasn't something that was like personally against them. It was a denial of the rights guaranteed by our Creator God. They appealed to the Supreme Judge. So let's listen to the Declaration of Independence now if you take God out of the picture. This will sound very secular. This will sound like uh, the news. (laughs) We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are equal and they have certain unalienable rights. Did you hear it? What's missing is the foundation of that self-evidence of those rights, the very basis for the equality of man and what our secularized world tries to do over and over, as one journalist put it, you can't enjoy a tree's fruit and spurn its roots. So Paul is praying that they'd continually be growing in this understanding, knowing what is right and what is wrong, and for what purpose? Let's listen to verses 10 and 11 again. I want you to understand... What really matters, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. Paul's priority is that we would know Christ, and in that knowing, overflowing more and more in love, growing in right thinking and making right choices, is that we are bearing the fruit of our salvation. 
bearing the fruit. When we're overflowing with love and we are thinking right and we are living right, our lives are pure and blameless and we're seeing good fruit in our lives. We're developing righteous character for the glory of God. That is Paul's priority and that should be our priority. If we want to press on like Paul pressed on, if we want to put it all into that last 15 meters and finish this race well, we've got to have our priorities right. Amen? That's our motivation for pressing on. We prioritize knowing Christ in this way, which brings us to our second point. Paul's passion was to preach Christ, to preach the gospel. Paul's circumstances, if you listen to those verses... He talks about how there's these people that they almost like took advantage of the fact that Paul, the you know, number one apostle guy, was now in prison. And so they're like, hey, this is our chance for a little bit of the, the spotlight, a little bit of the glory, our 15 minutes of fame. And so they have these mixed motives or these impure motives for why they are now preaching the gospel more. It's not everybody. There must have been some of them. Some people have the pure motives still. Uh, but Paul says... I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. It didn't get to him because his passion was that Christ was being preached. You see, he's in prison here, but his circumstances did not determine whether or not he would continue preaching the gospel and celebrate the gospel being preached. So Paul's in prison. Again, you can read about that in Acts chapter 21. Go all the way through those next six or seven chapters. Paul was falsely accused. He was attacked by a mob in Jerusalem the Roman guards didn't know what was going on. They thought he was somebody else. They took him, they beat him, they put him in prison, and then Paul's like, hey, this is who I am. This is, I'm a Roman citizen. They all freaked out because he's not supposed to just take Roman citizens and do that. It's this whole thing. You're going to have to go read it. It's like a better than TV drama, I'm telling you. Go, go read it. So this is Paul. He's been in prison for years, several years now. He's likely writing from Rome. And you know what? I was thinking about that. He very well could have had an entirely different perspective on his circumstances, right? He could have been thrown, he could have just said, that's enough, I'm done, I'm going to take the plea bargain, I'm going to walk out of here, I, I served the Lord for 30 years, and, and I'm just going to step out. But that's not what he did. That's not his perspective, and that's not the perspective of someone that says, I press on. Paul's goal was not his personal comfort. His passion was not this life of personal success or being acknowledged even for his own great ministry, Paul's passion was that the gospel was being preached. Listen to this. Paul gets to Rome. He's under the responsibility of the imperial guard, the palace guard. So he's likely made it into Nero's palace now. The end is near. He's probably down in that prison below the palace. And he says, everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. Do you hear how his passion aligns his perspective? His passion, spreading the good news. He was making the gospel of Jesus Christ known even to the imperial guards. He's in prison. He's letting the guards know about it. Everyone there knew he was in chains become, uh, because of Christ. And so my question at this point is, what are you passionate about? Would you be willing to be falsely accused and bound in chains for what you are passionate about? And then would you continue to be passionate for it? If not, then we go back to the first question, what is the number one priority in your life? Is it to know Christ or is it to know something else? We have Paul, he's there, he's in prison. Other ministers of the gospel, they rise up, they take advantage of this void from Paul's leadership not being in the arena, and they're preaching the gospel, some of them out of rivalry, some of them out of jealousy towards Paul and each other. But Paul says they're still preaching the good news. Paul says, my passion is preaching the good news. So if the good news is being preached, I rejoice in that, and I'm going to continue To rejoice. So when your priority is to know Christ and your passion is to share the good news, then other people's feelings towards you and their motives aren't a determining factor in whether or not you will rejoice in the good news being shared. Might have to chew on that one for a while, but that's good stuff, folks. 
We don't rejoice because we feel like we're sharing the good news better than someone else. Right? We rejoice that the good news is being shared. We're Christians. We're messengers of the gospel. So we rejoice when the good news is shared and we don't get caught up in people's motives. The other aspect of this is that even when bad things happen to us, they can be turned to positives when what we are passionate about and is being willing to continue sharing the good news. The goodness of God and his good news... The good of the good news is not contingent upon the amount of goodness I am currently experiencing. The goodness of the good news is not determined by the goodness I am currently feeling. Uh, What comes to mind is our brother Tim Hopwood, who embodied this when he got a sentence from a doctor that said terminal stage 4 cancer. Well, praise God. I don't know if you noticed, Tim is here. (laughs) Praise God. The goodness of God. Tim did not let the lack of apparent goodness in his circumstances determine his passion for sharing the good news. Amen? Amen. So we don't, we, we, we honor what you chose to do, but we praise God as an example to us all. Our passion being the, the good news. What's interesting is when you go through stuff that feels like this is really hard or unfair is that it puts you in contact with people that you would have never otherwise had a chance to even know existed. And again, Tim and Esther both took that very seriously. I don't know how many dozens of people you've prayed with. Uh, We just give the glory to God and we celebrate that you are still here. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And the church is encouraged. Paul looking at imprisonment, likely looking at death by this point, says, I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. Amen. So this continues to build. We're building on Paul's prison perspective and he has prioritized knowing Christ. The passion is to preach Christ. And now he considers it a privilege, everyone say privilege, to suffer for Christ. Listen to this. Philippians 1, 20 and 21, For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. For me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. Living means living for Christ. That means all of the living. There's no aspect of Paul's life that is outside of living for Christ. It's all for Jesus. Now I'm going to jump to chapter 3 here and give you a little more perspective from Paul. This is verse 7. I'll read through 11 here. This is the context. This is what he says right before he says all of the stuff about pressing on. You know, he has just talked about, if you read a little earlier, about all these things that should have been just like these valuable parts about himself, all of his successes that should have been the foundation of his notoriety as a Jew in ministry. This is what he says in verse 7. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ." For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Listen to him. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Paul considered it a privilege to suffer for Christ. Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He says, it's rubbish. It's garbage. Take it all. I just want Jesus. 
And then again, he says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ, experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. The only way you experience that is by dying. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. His priority is to know Christ. His passion is to preach Christ. His privilege is to suffer for Christ. And he says in verse 20 of chapter 1 again, I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ whether I live or die. Living is Christ. Dying means I cross that finish line. So whether I'm alive, I live for Christ. Whether I cross the finish line and run into his arms, it's for Christ. Our world epitomizes a perspective that is so different than what Paul is sharing in the letter to the Philippians. We look to in this world, we, we prioritize and we revolve, literally put ourselves at the center of the universe. We say, what's in it for me? What's in it for my best interest? What makes me feel comfortable? What allows me to achieve my goals? We prioritize things like self-actualization, self-fulfillment, being the best version of yourself and feeling really good about it. But it's lacking something. The Apostle Paul, he prioritizes becoming more and more like Jesus Christ, overflowing with agape love, thinking right and living right, this life full of righteous fruit and good character, preaching Christ, sharing the good news regardless of his circumstances to the point of being willing to suffer for Christ and to die for Christ in chains. I'll invite you to stand this morning. I'm going to invite the worship team. They're going to come and lead us through a song as a response today. But this month, we're going to be challenging, challenging each other. You'll hear the other speakers this month challenge us on the way that our perspectives in life, how we're setting our priorities, the passions that we live for, what you consider as your privileges. Be challenging in those things. And so this morning, I call you, as a church, to lay it all down. Like we were singing, that we would live for the cause of Christ.